Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Nathan with Life and Safety Consultants. We will be recording this presentation as we have with our others in the past, and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel. An email with that information will go out either this afternoon or tomorrow when it becomes available. I did want to let everyone know that we have our next webinar already set up and scheduled. A representative from Abbott Diagnostics will be presenting information on the different types of COVID-19 testing and what that can mean for business as far as a return to work policy and business continuity. Again, there'll be an email that goes out with more information on that after this webinar. The two presenters today are Joshua Unger and Jeff Spiker. I will turn this over to them in just a moment. I'll give just a couple more minutes. It looks like we have people still joining in. Again, everyone will remain muted for the duration of this presentation. If you do have questions though, please feel free to put those into the chat window. If you are viewing this on your screen and you move your mouse over the presentation portion, there is a chat button that appears at the bottom of the screen that you can click if you do, again, want to enter in chat information. If you're not viewing the screen, that's fine. Our presenters will be speaking to the material as well, so you don't have to see what's on the screen to understand what's being presented. So again, we will have the question and answer at the end. Place those questions in the chat window. Josh and Jeff will be presenting, and at this point, I'm going to unmute Joshua. Josh, both you and Jeff can unmute yourselves as well if you do want to speak up at some point, but Joshua, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and turn the presentation over to you guys. Oh, oops. <laughs> there you go. You should be good to go. Okay. Can you hear me now, Nathan? <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm, if you guys weren't seeing that, I muted him as he unmuted himself. So we, we had a fun little technology moment there. Yeah, and in the sign of the times, if you hear someone doing yard work outside, forgive me. <laughs> Perfect timing. Thank you, Nathan. You're welcome. Um, all right, welcome to the wide, wide world of uh, respirator program management. Um, uh, let's start this right here. We can. So. Respirator protection, 29 CFR 1910.134 is our reference point. Um, respirator protection, uh, assuming a broad audience here, uh, is often used to protect against chronic hazards. Uh, what that means is, uh, unlike a uh, fall from height or an impact to the head or something instant, the effects of an injury from exposure to a respiratory hazard are not always immediately apparent. Um, hence the word chronic, the effects of prolonged exposure um, uh, may not mess manifest themselves for some time afterwards. Um, for different hazardous substances, a person could be exposed uh, to whatever the airborne contaminant is for minutes or even possibly years of their life before showing any signs of exposure. And respirators are simply the tools with which employers equip their workers um, to help protect themselves uh, from these airborne hazards when we cannot remove them some other way. So if we're going to have respirators in a workplace, we need to establish a respirator protection program. Um, by regulation, a program administer uh, must understand the state or federal and state regulations. For those in South Carolina, our state regulations mirror the federal requirements as required. Um, and a simple if-then statement here, if you're going to use respirators, then we need to have a written program. And if you're going to write it down, then it needs to incorporate and follow the OSHA regulations in 1910. Um, the program must incorporate um, all the requirements from the OSHA respirator standard. Um, it must identify and address the known uh, and anticipated workplace hazards uh, and then account for the health of the workers that are actually wearing the respirators. Um, there are a um, number of, excuse me, ooh, going through slides. There are a number of online resources that exist to help us in this as health and safety managers and consultants, um, and we can create uh, from those resources a pretty effective respiratory protection program. Um, obviously, OSHA website, uh, but also NIOSH, uh, and then certain respirator and filter manufacturers are also super helpful in this process. 3M, MSA, Honeywell, there's probably some other ones as well. And so that, that's our goal today is just to outline some of those considerations for compliance with the OSHA uh, regulations to help protect workers um, by said effective program. All right, 
like I said, the respiratory protection um, in the workplace begins and ends with the written program. Um, uh, it is required by OSHA and, and it's the easiest way to organize ourselves is to write it down. Um, I already mentioned that uh, we require a program administrator to perform uh, all the functions here uh, and oversee the program. Uh, here are the documentation and work, uh, worksite specific procedures that are required by regulation. Number one, we need to look at respirator selection and how we get there. Number two, medical evaluations of those that are going to be using respirators. Um, also, we're going to look at the specific use of the respirators in the workplace. Um, we are also required to maintain and care those respirators uh, involving inspection and replacement uh, and repair. Um, for air supplied respirators, uh, there's also provisions for assuring the uh, adequate air quality. Um, and then of course, training uh, for those that are gonna be using to make sure they understand what they are doing with the respirator and how it's protecting them. Uh, uh, and also fit testing to make sure we have a proper, air, proper fit um, for each individual user. Um, OSHA regulations also require program evaluation periodically to make sure that uh, users are using them properly and we are still protecting against hazards in the workplace. So I guess to begin with, let's look at um, respirator selection. We need to determine uh, what the potential exposures to hazardous substances are. And so in conducting a exposure assessment, employers need to determine, number one, what are the hazards present uh, there? Um, the simplest way to do this and a good place to start is the safety data sheets for chemicals that are present in the workplace. Uh, but then we can also, and need to most often, um, do some kind of um, atmospheric testing or industrial hygiene monitoring um, uh, to do air sampling to see just because the chemicals are present, what are the levels that um, uh, employees are potentially going to be exposed to? And then number three, whether or not those levels are acceptable um, will help us make our uh, following decisions. And so once we have done some kind of atmospheric testing, did the results fall below or above the OSHA personal exposure limits or PEL, or did they fall above or below the ACGIH's uh, threshold limit values? Um, for those who would like to know, I guess, the threshold limit value of a chemical substance is what is believed to be the level which a worker can be exposed day after day for a working lifetime uh, without any adverse effects. And so we first need to uh, assess what are our potential and real exposures? Um, and then at the bottom there, if there are ever any, anytime there are changes in the workplace that could result in uh, any new or altered exposures, we need to reassess uh, those workplaces. That Those changes could involve uh, whether we get new equipment, new processes, new products. Uh, maybe we have added some control measures and could eliminate respirator uh, protection in a certain area or uh, work task. Um, or possibly any seasonal changes that would come also. Um, there are uh, numerous different hazards out there, of course. Four categories of those would include dust, fumes, and mists, um, gases and vapors. Uh, we need to consider oxygen availability and uh, potential deficiency as well, and then any temperature extremes. Um, and underneath those four categories, there is obviously a litany and list of different specific substances or possibilities. Uh, that we need to protect against. But before we get to um, the implementation of respirator use, um, there may be ways for us to um, actually reduce exposure levels um, without the use of respirators. So just good safety practice includes this NIOSH hierarchy of controls. And so the respirator uh, um, uh, program administrators should first see whether or not exposures can be control, controlled through um, the top three you know, engineering controls of elimination, substitution, or again, engineering controls before we look at administrative controls, including PPE. Um, so if it is possible to use a different substance or a different process that gets the hazard out of there, of course, no hazard, uh, no risk, no respirators. Uh, secondly, the second tier down would be, can we substitute and replace either said chemical or process to something that is uh, less hazardous or non-hazardous? Uh, um, and then thirdly, is there a way for us to 
uh, if we can't eliminate or substitute and actually isolate workers from that hazard um, uh, by performing the task with the chemicals uh, inside a booth, um, maybe there is some kind of ventilation procedure, or excuse me, ventilation equipment um, that would keep them from there. Um, or administratively, uh, if we have done our industrial hygiene monitoring and find that the levels were marginal or um, below uh, exposure limits, if the worker were to not say work a complete shift, can we rotate workers or put some other kind of work uh, instructions or standard operating procedures to change the way the work is performed? And obviously, there's a lot of ways we can do that also. And if then um, those are not effective to reduce um, exposure to an acceptable level, then we're going to start uh, using PPA and implement a respiratory protection program. As far as respirator selection, after we have done a hazard assessment, um, uh, if the exposure levels from that exposure assessment, um, they need to be compared to the PEL uh, that's set by OSHA to determine whether or not we do need respirators, as I said. There are also other occupational exposure limits or OEL set by some alternative agencies, namely NIOSH, or excuse me, namely ACGIH, uh, and we should consider those also, um, even if we're below the OSHA PEL. Um, in the, for what it's worth category, any respirator that's used in the US workplace must be approved by NIOSH, and all NIOSH approved respirators um, have a, an assigned protection factor. And without getting down on the weeds, just know that that assigned protection factor ranges from 10 to 10,000. And what that means is that respirator or class of respirators is, is expected to provide um, a certain level of protection when worn and used properly. So simply put, an APF of 10, for example, means that if that respirator has an APF of 10, um, when it's used correctly, uh, it can reduce the exposure levels that are up to 10 times the PEL of the hazard uh, to a level determined by OSHA that's acceptable for workers. In other words, an APF of 10 means that no more than one-tenth of the contaminant um, to which the worker is exposed will leak uh, inside the mass. Again, the asterisk there is when used correctly. Uh, again, an APF of 100 then would mean that only you're only getting a 1% leak, leakage uh, from that respirator. So when we're considering respiratory products, the we need to first identify what the necessary APF um, is. Um, and as far as wearing them correctly of note, I guess we need to also consider what the other work processes uh, or other hazards are when they're doing that. Do they need to wear glasses? Will those glasses uh, compete for space um, or get in the way of uh, the bridge of their nose where that respirator may sit if it's a half face respirator? Um, so we need to consider multiple options uh, as health and safety professionals um, for not only the respiratory protection that we're going to choose, but also the other PPE and what's the best way to ensure that it's that employees are going to be comfortable as well as protected. Um, and because uh, you know faces come in all shapes and sizes, uh, workers may need to try on a variety of models and/or sizes in combination with the other things that they have to wear in the workplace, um, so that it's. You know, hopefully lightweight, uh, it's streamlined. Um, simply put, we know that the best tools that we can provide them as far as not just respirators, but other PPE are those that the workers are going to want to wear. And so when we go through respirator selection, there are a couple of, and these are just some examples of uh, tools that are out there. 3M respirator selection guide for their manufactured inspectors. NSA has a similar thing as well as others. And then I'm going to come back to uh, the NIOSH respirator selection logic. Um, I'm not going to go through it in full, of course, today in our short time, uh, but there is a good if-then uh, decision tree uh, that I think can help us um, uh, think through how we get to the correct respirator. All right, another, another item we need to consider to comply with the uh, OSHA regulations in 1910.134 is once we have assessed uh, the environment they're working in and um, selected some respirators that will work. If we are going to put a user into a respirator, we need to protect that respir respirator wearer um, from some potential harm of wearing a respirator because it does put a physiological 
um, burden onto that person. So before we wear a respirator, a worker needs to uh, get medical approval. approval. Um, and so OSHA requires the worker to first complete a questionnaire and ask questions about not only their medical conditions that could affect that ability to wear a respirator, um, but also the workplace conditions and the hazards that they face um, when they're doing their job. And that licensed healthcare professional then must evaluate those responses and advise whether they're not, are they able to wear that class of respirator or not? Um, and then if a worker is medically approved, um, he or she must then go through a fit test for uh, if you're gonna be wearing a tight fitting respirator, because um, we need to ensure that the selected respirator is actually uh, capable of um, protecting, uh, excuse me, fitting on that worker correctly. OSHA um, has not established a, a time frame on when we need to repeat a medical evaluation. However, all workers who are using respirators after initial medical evaluation and clearance must be reevaluated in any of these four scenarios. A worker needs to be reevaluated if they personally report any signs or symptoms uh, that may affect his or her ability to safely use that respirator. Also, if uh, a a physician, a supervisor, or the respiratory program administrator requests it for some reason, um, then we need to have them reevaluated. Uh, or if during the fit test, after they've been medically evaluated, during, if, if during the fit test uh, or program evaluation that we need to perform regularly indicates the need, then we reevaluate. Uh, and then, of course, if there is ever any changes or conditions in the workplace um, that could increase the burden of the worker, um, such as uh, temperature or their level of exertion, depending on the type of work they're doing, um, or other equipment needs, then we should probably reevaluate and we need to reevaluate that person uh, for their ability to safely wear the respirator uh, during their job. Um, probably my favorite slide of all there's a heart. That heart is uh, showing our affection for uh, a Jeff Spiker. Um, is if there is any guesses on when this photo was taken. I think I know what it is. Um, maybe we can start a pot and uh, uh, take the over under anyway. Next, after medical evaluation, um, before an employee uses a respirator with either a negative or positive uh, pressure, tight fitting face piece, the employee must be fit, fit tested, excuse me, with the same make, model, style, and size of the respirator that they're gonna be using on the job. Um, Hence, the, with that term, tight fitting, um, tight fitting respirators cannot provide proper protection without a tight seal between the actual face piece of the respirator and the wearer's face. And so um, that's what the fit test is there to test is, will the respirator actually fit to their face? And there are a couple of ways that that gets done. The employee's got to pass either a qualitative fit test or a quantitative fit test. I'll repeat again, prior to initial use, whenever there is a different respirator face piece used, and then uh, annually thereafter, uh, we need to fit test. Um, just a, a quick description of qualitative versus quantitative. Um, a qualitative fit test relies on the wearer's sense of taste or smell uh, to detect whether or not that, that seal is tight. And so what we do is when we perform that test, they put their uh, respirator on and then a mask is done in one of four, odiferous or irritating substances is released. Um, most often, I see vitrix uh, used. Uh, there's also an irritant smoke, um, saccharin, uh, or there's an acetate, an iso, isomyl, did I say that right? Um, acetate. Simply put, put the respirator on, put the fit testing hood over that, spray the um, irritant or, or substance into that mask, and if the user can smell or taste it, or is otherwise affected by that, uh, then that means the seal does not provide adequate protection. Um, and so then we need to uh, start over with our selection or look at what's causing that to not seal correctly. Um, the qualitative test that I just described is normally used for half face respirators. Uh, if we are going to test for a full face respirator, then we need to um, most probably use a quantitative fit test um, unlike the qualitative, the quantitative fit test relies on a machine that actually attaches to the respirator via a tube. And while the wearer performs exercises that can induce face, face piece leakage, similar to what you would do with a qualitative test, 
Uh, there's, but there's actually an instrument in a quantitative test that numer numerically measures the amount of leakage into the respirator, or yes, into the respirator. Um, and again, normally quantitative fit tests are performed uh, and preferred for full face, full face respirators. Um, also of note about fit testing, uh, we need to conduct an additional fit test whenever the employee report reports to us or the employer employee your uh, or a doctor or a licensed healthcare provider makes any visual observations about the employee's uh, physical condition if that has changed at all um, if they have um, uh, somehow obtained any facial scarring uh, dental changes um, uh, cosmetic surgery uh, or even if somebody loses or gains a bunch of weight that could affect how that respirator fits uh, and then facial hair um, of course, those of us that are emotionally attached to our beards um, uh, would prefer not to have to shave those. The rule on facial hair is you have to be clean, clean shaven where the respirator seals to the respirator user's face um, if it is a tight fitting. If that is an issue, then there are loose fitting respirators that are an option. But for tight fitting respirators, they must be clean shaven. All right, moving on. One of the other requirements uh, in the OSHA regulation is that OSHA um, mandates that employers uh, ensure that their workers are trained uh, and they need to be trained annually. Um, the purpose of this is to provide, not only to dictate information, but to provide a forum for the users to become reacquainted uh, with that information and, the, and specifically the importance of their respirator protection. Um, and then it just gives everyone a refresher course, obviously, and the proper use and care of the equipment. And here is the list of things that are required in that training. Uh, at minimum, when you are training respirator users that are your employees, they need to know why they need those respirators. What are the hazards? Um, and then secondly, what can that respirator do and what can it not do to protect it? Um, they also need to be instructed in how to properly inspect it, um, to don and doff or to put on and take off, um, uh, to use that respirator correctly. Um, if required, they need to know how to perform a user seal check uh, for themselves before each use. They also need to um, know how to use the respirator effectively in an emergency situation. Um, and then also how to recognize uh, any medical signs and symptoms that may limit or prevent the workers from using that respirator um, so that they can self-examine uh, uh, themselves as well. Also, they need to know how improper fit, improper use, or improper maintenance can reduce the effectiveness of, of that rep respirator. Um, they need to be instructed in how to maintain it, how to store it. Uh, and then they also need to know that this is requirements um, by OSHA uh, and what are those standard requirements. Um, regarding the user's inspection and maintenance, they need to um, be inspected before each use, as I just mentioned, and during cleaning. Um, and the users need to follow the manufacturer's uh, instructions for use and care on how to do that. And then also, like I mentioned, um, uh, how to use it in an emergency situation, but excuse me, specifically for emergency respirators, those also need should be inspected at least monthly before uh, and before and after each use. When they are inspecting, those considerations um, that they're going to uh, look at include the respiratory function of the respirator itself, uh, the tightness and connection, uh, the pliability of elastomeric parts. Uh, that just means flexible and stretchy, the rubber part of the face mask that actually uh, touches your face on a tight fitting uh, respirator. Um, and then they need to look at the condition of all the other various parts of the face piece, the head straps, the valves, the connecting tube, any cartridges, canisters, or filters. And they need to consider at that point when they're inspecting um, a filter and canister change uh, schedule per the manufacturer of that. Okay. Um, the ninth or last uh, section of the OSHA regulations uh, is program evaluations. The program administer. Um, should evaluate all the elements of that respiratory protection program regularly. Um, they need to examine all the records, 
uh, whether that's from medical evaluations, any industrial hygiene monitoring, any tests we've done um, in the plant or with the users and make sure that all those are up to date. Not just also besides just examining all the records, they should also observe and talk to the actual users. Uh, this is just good business practice, right? Um, uh, and see what the users say about um, the respirators if they're meeting their needs and if the workers still understand and, and are they actually following the procedures for using and maintaining them. Um, it's important to make a record of all these evaluations and findings and we need to note those deficiencies um, uh, as good best practice. Um, and then to document if there's anything that does need to be changed, any of those corrective measures we ought to uh, be writing down also. Um, because all these observations and records will help us when we are actually doing the update of the written program. Um, ma managing uh, the respiratory protection program, it's not only going to keep us compliant uh, with relevant regulations, but this well-run program uh, is also just the best way to help ensure that the workers uh, are protected from hazards, and that is the ultimate goal. Um, so those are the requirements for the OSHA respiratory written program. Um, just to take a few minutes for everybody, um, let's look at uh, the respirators themselves just from a high level, a categorical level. Um, uh, elementary, what is a respirator? It's a protective device that covers the mouth and nose or the entire face or head to guard the wearer against hazardous atmospheres. And we can put those into a couple different categories. Um, they can be tight fitting or loose fitting, as I mentioned. Um, and they can uh, be either air purifying or um, atmosphere supplying as well. All right, um, a whole bunch of words on a slide here. Um, the types of respirators, elastomeric respirators are either half or full plates respirators that have uh, filters or cartridges on them uh, that filter certain particles or gases or vapors, depending on what uh, filter or cartridge or canister we put onto those respirators. Uh, the middle one filtering face piece respirators, um, maybe otherwise known as dust masks, they cover the nose and mouth and are used to protect against particulate hazards. Um, and then the last category there is powered air purifying respirators, PAPRs, or supplied air respirators, which include uh, SCBAs or uh, self-contained breathing apparatuses. Um, they are powered or supplied respirators that do the work of actually pushing the air uh, to the respirator uh, at the uh, head or the top of the face piece. They can either be powered by air using a battery powered blower, uh, or they could have supplied air bringing clean air in through the hose from a source outside of the contaminated area. Um, they are tight fitting. If they are tight fitting, excuse me, they must be fit tested when in use. Uh, and the users must perform a seal check every time that they actually put those uh, tight fist fitting negative pressure respirators on. Um, uh, there are, is another style there at the bottom, loose fitting respirators typically uh, have a hood or a helmet that goes over their shoulders. It's probably best seen by picture. Um, and there are no pictures on the slide. Where'd the pictures go? Uh, there we go. All right, so here's your different types of air purifying uh, respirators, upper left there, dust mask. I think everybody's familiar with that, uh, definitely in uh, the times that we live right now. Um, uh, in the middle upper is a half mask uh, where it goes over your nose and mouth but does not cover your eyes, uh, followed by a full face respirator on the right that covers obviously your full face. Um, and then on the bottom there, we have two different styles of uh, loose fitting. There is on the left there a hood. It's a PAPR, a powered air purifying respirator. Uh, or excuse me, a mask on the left and then a hood on the right that uh, sits over the user's shoulders to create the seal. That's air purifying. Um, atmosphere supplying. Atmosphere supplying respirators uh, supplies the user with their breathing air from other sources, uh, either a compressor or a tank. It is not the ambient air. We use these in what's called an IDLH environment. Again, an IDLH environment, immediately dangerous to life and health. Um, these obviously need to be fit tested as well if they are going to be used in said environment. Um, and there's your 
surgery. Uh, supplied air respirator on the left, there is abrasive blasting continuous flow hoods there, and on the right, what we see firefighters and others use uh, in rescue situations and other situations, uh, your SCBAs. Okay, there's your different types of uh, respirators. I'm not going to spend very long here, but um, uh, for those of us that uh, would need some assistance in like, okay, here's my hazards. What kind of respirator do I actually need to use? So I'm referencing a document I showed a picture of earlier. I am not going to go through this to completion, obviously, for time's sake. Um, but I think it's helpful for everybody to see this is the logic we need to go through. Step one, simple question. Is the respirator intended for use during firefighting? If the answer is yes, we can only use a full face pressure demand self-contained breathing apparatus for that. If the answer is no, then we go to step two. Step two, is the respirator intended for use in an oxygen deficient atmosphere or less than 19.5%? Um, if that is yes, then any type of SCBA or um, other than an escape only uh, or supplied air respirator um, uh, is required. If we say yes, and there's also conta other contaminants present, then we're gonna go to step three also. Um, but if we answer no to um, using it in a um, oxygen deficient environment, then we're gonna go to step three. Step three is the respirator intended for entry into an unknown or immediately dangerous to life and health atmosphere like an emergency situation. And if the answer is yes to that, then we are still looking at SCBAs or some uh, supplied air respirator. But if the answer is no, we're not firefighting, it's not an oxygen deficient atmosphere, and it's not an IDLH atmosphere, then we proceed to step four. Step four, if is the uh, exposure concentration of the contaminants as determined by, determined by acceptable industrial hygiene methods less than the NIOSH REL or other exposure element or OSHA PEL. Um, uh, and if that is the case, um, uh, a respirator is not required for routine work. Uh, for escape respirators, then of course we would need to provide the escape respirators. But if the answer is no to step four, then we go on to step five. Um, and are the conditions such that a worker who is required to wear a respirator can escape from the work area and not suffer loss of life for immediate or delayed irreversible health effects uh, if the respirator fails, blah, blah, blah. If yes, it's not considered IDLH, proceed to step six. And step six says, is the contaminant an eye irritant or can the contaminant cause eye damage uh, in the workplace? And if yes, then we need to equip them with a full face respirator hood or helmet. If no, a half mask or quarter mask uh, respirator may be an option, um, proceed to step seven. And then we get into this calculation of determining the max or hazard, maximum hazard ratio um, and looking at time-weighted averages, whether that's uh, or short-term exposure limit uh, or ceiling limit or something like this, using the industrial hygiene monitoring data. Um, uh, proceed to step eight. Uh, again, uh, if the physical state of the contaminant is, is it a particulate? Is it a gas or vapor? Is it a combination of gas or vapor and particulate? And it goes on, so on and so on. Uh, through that logic. Um, fun stuff. All right, so in summary, um, uh, here are the nine areas that are required in starting a respirator program and maintaining it. Selection of respirators. We need to medically evaluate those that are going to use said respirators. They need to be fit tested to maintain a proper fit. Number four, they need to know, we need to establish, and they need to know the rules for use where, how often, how to clean it, uh, and step five, maintenance and care. Step six, if we are using uh, supplied air of some kind, uh, we need to go through that process to make sure that the air quality is good. Number seven, we need to train in all these hazards in proper use, periodically uh, evaluate that program, and number nine, uh, uh, have good record keeping and keep all that data and notes um, for updating our program through time. So there you have it, there you are. This part of the uh, ride has concluded. Um, I thank you for your kind attention. Um, uh, we will answer any questions after Jeff has completed here, but now I guess it's a, a note from a, a word from our sponsor. Uh, Jeff Spiker, take it away. All right, Jeff, I've just, this is Nathan. I just unmuted you and Joshua, you're gonna turn over the screen to him. Um, or now we're in two slides, I'm not sure. 
All right, Jeff, you're you're up. Okay, um, let's see here. Um, can Josh, do you have my last two or three slides on there? Yes, right now we're showing the first of the three slides. Okay. Let me look here. Okay, so yeah, so um, good deal. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, as you guys can see, um, certainly there is a lot to a lot to cover. Um, this is a complicated standard. Uh, it's complex. There's many, many elements to it. Um, what I'd like to do and what I thought would be useful is kind of look at look at all of this and kind of the real world aspect. OK, so, you know, we, we've just reviewed the standard, but let's see what this looks like um, kind of in real world uh, form. So we'll talk a little bit about um, how we'll show the statistics and where these rank as far as citations go. Um, and then I pulled up two citations to give you guys an example. Of, of what this looks like and also discuss some pitfalls that we see uh, when we're out there um, in, in the workplace specific to, to respiratory protection. So uh, as you guys imagine, there's lots to, uh, to comply with here. Um, as a result, um, respiratory protection has been in the OSHA's top 10 for many years. Uh, it's anywhere ranked between four and five. Um, I think many reasons for that, one of which is it covers a lot of workplaces. OSHA estimates that it covers 1.3 million workplaces, uh, resulting in you know, exposure to 5 million workers. The other uh, reason why it shows up a lot, uh, it goes back to how complex the standard is. Um, and administering the program can be very difficult. And we see a lot of uh, facilities you know, struggle with maintaining all of the elements uh, for this. Um, a, lot of, a lot of times turnover, uh, not having one person um, kind of one point of contact in charge of the program uh, leads to issues. Um, again, going back to that program administrator is important. Um, what I see a lot is um, if we don't have that important program administrator, uh, with all the new hires and turnover, um, you know, some, some employees, um, if they're required to, to wear a respirator, um, you know, they, they, some companies have a, um, like a gatekeeper that'll say, all right, well, this, you're in this job task, here's your respirator. Some companies where respirators aren't required, but some employees would like to wear the respirators, um, you know, these employees may get hired and after two or three weeks, they want a respirator. They go to their supervisor and ask for them, but they don't go through the proper channels of medical evaluations, fit testing, et cetera. So again, a very difficult standard to, uh, to comply with. But some of the top violations that we see here, number one is that medical evaluation. Um, this definitely has to be provided before the employee is fit tested. So um, you wanna make sure that you do this evaluation and then you have your clearance before you do your fit testing and, uh, and training. Um, sometimes when I'm auditing facilities, I'll take a look at the dates and stuff, and um, it's important that you do it in the proper sequence. Um, sometimes I'll see that uh, um, somebody did a fit test and training, and then their medical evaluation was done 10 days after that. Um, so, um, you know, again, sometimes those are difficult to do. So, uh, the um, doing them first of all, and then making sure you do in the proper sequence is also important. Uh, number two is your general respiratory protection program. Again, this goes back to a written program. Um, all the elements that Joshua talked about should be included in your respirator program, including a program administrator, how you do your evaluations, fit testing, et cetera, um, and then how you do a program evaluation. So that's important as well. Number three is, is simply your fit testing. Um, you need to have your fit testing. A couple important things to remember there is uh, making sure you have the proper size, model, and make of the respirator, and make sure that um, you both let the employee know that said, you know, to say, hey, if, if you're going to get a new respirator, here's here's exactly the type that you need. If not, if you get a different one, we'll have to refit test you. And again, that's also important for the program administrator to keep records of those. Uh, we like to use Excel spreadsheets and so forth uh, to get a quick reference on uh, when a new when employee needs a new respirator, uh, this is the exact configuration, size, style, model, make uh, that's required. So, next slide there, please, Joshua or Nathan. 
Um, number four is uh, establishing respiratory program. This one, um, this one specifically doesn't say on here, but the C2I, this refers to um, the use of voluntary, uh, voluntary use of, of respirators, specifically to those dust masks. Why this gets cited a lot is because a lot of people will issue uh, dust masks to their employees on a voluntary basis. However, they don't do any training on it. Um, this, many of you may have heard of OSHA's Appendix D. Uh, this is where this comes into play. Um, so if you're having employees wear respirators on a voluntary basis, specifically the dust masks, uh, you need to have them read and sign the Appendix D form. What that does is that serves as some type of training uh, for that for that type of respirator, um, you know, it, it, although it doesn't fit in all of the elements of the normal program, you do have to do some type of training on it so people know know that you can't use them in IDLH atmospheres, that they're not going to protect against certain contaminants, and then also how to you know basically dispose of it and not reuse it. So that's why that one's common because those dust masks show up a lot in inside of many facilities. Uh, and then number five, hazard evaluation. Joshua talked about that. This is where, um, you know, this is where it ties into your industrial hygiene monitoring. So, um, you know, this is where you kind of do your baseline, okay? So um, this is where you determine whether or not you need respirators. So uh, it, it, any company, it's good to kind of do a baseline. You know, we do like a qualitative assessment to figure out you know, what we need to sample for. Then we do our quantitative assessment, which is your air, air sampling. Once we get the uh, results, then we look at the hierarchy of controls and so forth, put people in respirators. And if we can't reduce the levels, then we, uh, we have an ongoing respirator uh, program. And then we also have a plan. We should also have a plan moving forward on when to resample and and so forth. So if you're, you know, maybe below 10% of the PEL, you sample three every three to four years. Uh, but if you're over the PEL and still wearing respirators, you may want to sample annually. Um, then of course, uh, if there's any changes to your facility, uh, we want to resample as well. So those are kind of the top five. Um, what I've done is, is I've put together some examples of citations. Um, and I was going to share my screen here. Share that. Okay, U.S. Department of Labor. So, um, one of the citations I pulled up. This is kind of recent, and I, I pulled this one up because this applies to the N95 masks. Uh, because of the pandemic, um, N95 masks uh, have been used, um, and they are now required in a lot more situations than they were before. Um, and as you know, if, if you have a N95 respirator and as an employer, you're requiring the use of that, meaning you require your employees to wear that respirator, all of the elements of the respirator program come into play. Okay, so what you're seeing now is a lot of uh, healthcare facilities. In this case, this is a nurse, nursing uh, home facility. Um, they are now requiring these N95 masks uh, for their specific job tasks. And when you do that, you have to have all of the elements that we had talked about. So this one was a particular um, nursing home in Ohio. As you can see, the date was uh, March, and that's kind of when everything started to get in a, uh, come into play here. Um, and then you see citation one, item 1A, uh, 134 C1. That goes back to having a written respiratory protection program that includes all the elements that Josh had mentioned. Um, in this particular case, uh, employees were wearing respirators for administering uh, particular respiratory treatment. And as, re as a result, their employee required them to wear these masks. And then this is the summary of what they got cited for, okay? We didn't have a policy to include medical evaluations, didn't have a provisions for fit testing, uh, the policy does not include procedures for cleaning, disinfecting, storing, inspecting, repairing, discarding, and otherwise maintaining respirators. That's long-winded. <laughs> um, in this particular case, um, you know, they, if you guys can remember in March, there was different guidelines out there for the reuse of these masks because there was a sort of shortage. They actually um, referenced, you know, that they weren't following the CDC guidelines on when you can use them, and that was an ever-changing 
uh, guidance that uh, probably is still changing. I think it's they, they've come down to uh, some consistency there. But uh, D, they didn't have policy for training employees. So uh, the inspection there was, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, $13,500. So um, again, that's an example of some citations. Um, they cited this one separately for not having the medical evaluations. But again, that goes back to um, the N95 masks. And what we're seeing a lot now is um, a lot of host companies, um, large companies are requiring N95 masks, maybe for their employees, but also for contractors. So, you know, we're helping a lot of contractors out with, you know, putting this program in place, doing our medical evaluations, fit testing, training, because they have to have all of this on place or in place before they uh, go to the host site and have to have their documentation uh, there. So a little bit more emphasis now on the N95 masks, maybe before, uh, maybe than there was before. Um, the next citation is with regard to manufacturing. Um, so what we do a lot of times is like when we're working with our partnerships or, you know, ongoing customers and we start the project, I always like to pull up uh, some OSHA citations or look in the OSHA website and see, you know, within their uh, NICS code, what people are getting cited for. And so even Google and see if you can find examples of citations. This uh, helps us, you know, get on the same page and kind of, you know, um, you know, allows the allows the employer to know and understand that, you know, this is that this is really this is a real deal. This is what can happen if if you don't if you don't comply with the regulation. So, uh, we work with a lot of companies that have powder coating booths. So I pulled this one up. Uh, this is a larger citation. Um, I only focused on the respiratory aspects of it. Um, there was PPE, uh, PPE, uh, PPE, um, also uh, hazard communication standards, but wanted to focus here just on the respiratory one. So um, as you can see here, this is from 2013, but it's still relevant. Um, this employer had cert two situations where they required uh, employees to wear respirators and a powder coating paint, and then also when they were using uh, MEK, meth meth methyl ethyl ketone. So they were having people wear respirators. However, if you guys can see here, um, they didn't have a resp written respiratory, resp respiratory protection program, uh, as we outlined. Um, citation was 4,200 for that one. Um, citation one of five, um, this is when we go back to evaluating the hazards. We talked about that um, industrial hygiene survey. So they didn't have any uh, data um, on that. Um, so again, that was of another 4,200. Item one of six, um, this goes back to the medical evaluations. Again, those are important. Those are required before the employee was fit tested. Um, so they didn't have that in place. Um, citation one of seven, um, employees were not fit tested. Um, again, that's an important aspect of it, another 4,200 there. Um, citation one of eight, uh, this is one we see calm, I, I see in tons of facilities, and this is where respirators are not stored, protect them from damage, contamination, sunlight, or even contaminants. Um, you know, you can walk into many facilities and you'll see respirators just hanging out in your paint booth or what have you. Um, and this one really is tough to manage also because you really got to stay on your employees. You got to provide them the bags or the Tupperware containers for this. Um, but again, it's just goes back to, it goes back to the fact that this is, you know, a, a difficult standard to manage. Um, so again, you'll see this in many facilities, again, tough to manage. Uh, citation one of nine, um, this goes back to the respiratory training. So um, employees need to do the training so as well. So, and again, remember the fit testing and the training are annual requirements, okay? So um, again, if you guys find that your, your, your folks aren't, you know, cleaning uh, the respirators, if they're not storing them properly, you may have to do some training more, more times than annual. Because uh, the main goal of the training is not just to do the training, but to make sure your employees are following and understand what the hazards uh, are if they don't follow, you know, the cleaning procedures. And again, uh, that a lot of that goes back to what the manufacturer says. Um, so again, as you guys can see, these these fines can add up. Um, again, 
this is a difficult standard to manage, but I think one of the, 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 the more successful programs I've seen is where they do have a, an established program administrator um, that is involved in the hiring process um, so that um, you know, employees, if they are gonna wear respirators, you know, that's covered at the very beginning so they can run through the process um, and it's not after the fact. So, uh, but those are just some examples. Um, that is all that I had. So I don't know if there were any questions. All right, this is Nathan. Thank you guys for your presentation today. I do have, we do have a couple of questions that I'm going to field. If any of you who are participating in this webinar would like to type a question into the chat window, please feel free to do that. Again, you'll see a chat button if you move your mouse over the main part of the screen. It appears at the bottom or it could also appear at the top depending on how you have it set up. The, the first question that we have here, guys, is can employees provide their own masks? Joshua, you want to, um, I guess, I guess um, I could say yes. However, it needs to be within the, it, 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 they need to be, you have to run through the proper selection process. So Correct. Um, remember that the NIOSH. So I guess if they wanted to provide their own mask, somebody at the facility would have to, somebody who's trained um, kind of like a program administrator, would have to run through that selection process just to make sure that it's the proper type uh, for the hazards and contaminants there. Um, and then that they follow, they'll still have to follow all the, the, the proper procedures for the medical evaluations, uh, et cetera. But they do have to be appropriate for the hazards um, and uh, you know, not really you know, cause any issues with their job. Gotcha. Um, okay. I, may I add to that? Uh, yes, yes, go ahead. That if employers are required to provide respirators for their employees. If it is mandated because of a known hazard, they are required to provide it. Um, as far as employees wanting to bring their own um, uh, and use it on a voluntary basis, if they're voluntary using the respirator, there is no known hazard in that workplace. Um, uh, so then it's just for uh, convenience, comfort, or some nuisance that they don't appreciate. So yes, they can do that in a if there is no known hazard. Okay, well that actually segues into my next into the next question. So if someone is not required but chooses to wear a respirator, well, well you guys talked about the Appendix D and that stands in place of the training. Where do the fit testing and medical qualification fit into that scenario, if at all? All right, so Jeff already mentioned this. You can uh, speak up, Jeff. But even in a voluntary use situation, all elements of the respirator program need to be um, uh, implemented except for the fit testing. OK. So the, qual the medical qualification would still have to take place if they are voluntarily using a respirator. That's correct. And then the Appendix D, they don't have to take the full training the append as long as they assign the Appendix D. Uh, and they, well, they need to be instructed in cleaning, inspecting, and maintaining it, like Jeff mentioned. Uh, okay. Okay, so the fit testing really is the only piece that they wouldn't necessarily have to do if it's voluntary use. That's correct. Okay. All right. Well, I don't have any other questions in the chat window. Thank you, everyone who joined us today. Again, we do have another webinar coming up on September 16th, which will be presented by Abbott Diagnostics. They're going to be talking about the different types of COVID testing, not just the one that tells you if you're actively infectious, but also if you have the antibodies, are you currently experiencing, are you currently sick, are you currently infectious, or are you ready to go back to work, which again means that we can implement elements of that in our return to work and business continuity process. Like, there'll be an email that goes out about that. There'll also be an email that goes out with information about this webinar, how to access it if you want to review it. And I think that's all we have for today. Is anything else you guys want to add before we close out? Oh, wait, we just did, we did just have a question come in. Uh, can you speak to medical evaluations where there is no good occupational medical provider? Actually, I can answer. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, we have an online medical qualification process. It does. It is online. It's 100% online. You log in. You fill out 
what type of respirator you're going to use, the conditions under which it's going to be used, and then you have the standard questionnaire. It's then submitted to a panel of doctors who review it. You typically get results back within an hour. If somebody answers a question, says, yes, they do have asthma or they have trouble breathing, they are going to refer them to a licensed healthcare professional to follow up over the phone still. So this is still remote. So if you have people who are in remote locations or you don't have an occupational health provider that does this, this is a great solution that we do offer. So I don't like making the webinar salesy, but since somebody did ask that, that is something that we do offer that can be valuable for people who need that service. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? All right, that sounds like a no. If you do want information on what I just described, the online medical evaluation, uh, just send us an email, send it to our info at Life and Safety. Or if you go onto our website, there is information there. You have to dig around for it. I think we've written some blogs about our medical qualification process and some of the other things that we do with our respiratory protection programs. So with that, unless there are any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and close out the webinar. Again, thank you everyone who joined and participated today. Also, thank you to our presenters, Josh Unger and Jeff Spiker. Thank you guys. Thank you much. Thanks.